let's get started. Uh, yeah, you all see the topic here, distributed authorization for with open policy agent. So this is four years ago. It's, uh, it was actually my first talk on OPA. Uh, I didn't know much about OPA when I submitted. So I figured like that's a good way to learn. So I submitted a talk and it, it was accepted. So I, I had like, I don't know, a month or two to learn OPA and Rego. So uh, four years later, I have 200 commits in the OPA code base. Uh, I've done about 100 talks on this topic. And here we are. Uh, also maintainer of two kids, uh, and I lead developer relations at Styra, which is the the inventors or the creators of of the Open Policy Agent or OPA. So it OPA is a is a is a how do you say a versatile tool? But today we'll talk about it for the topic of uh, API authorization specifically. So before we do that, I want to take a, a quick detour into identity. Uh, to see how that uh, evolved over time and moved from this kind of monolith architecture and into uh, a distributed one. So basically, I think we're all familiar with the, the architecture of, of the monolith. Basically means the application does everything. So uh, application does authentication, it does access control, it has to verify the identity of the user, it has to verify that uh, the operation or the action the user is trying to do is, is allowed. And if it is, it uh, goes out, fetches the data, and returns that to the user. And so the user and the application additionally handles credentials. So uh, basically, all of authentication and access control are done in one single place. How, how would we scale this up if we have like hundreds or thousands of these services? So the naive model, if we were to translate what we had or what we saw in the, in the last screen and, and move that into a distributed environment, it probably would look something like this. We still have a user. The user pro provides some credentials. These credentials are passed around between these services. All the services have to, do, uh, have to look up the identity of the user. It has to know uh, whether the, the action should be allowed or not before eventually getting down to the data, returning something to the user. So I'm sure you all see a whole bunch of problems with this model. So if we start out uh, on the identity side, uh, a few things are obvious. The first one is, of course, we'd rather not pass around credentials between services. That is uh, problematic from, from a whole bunch of, of uh, Standpoint, but one one is of course we don't we don't want credentials like passwords uh, ending up in the logs, and these services should have uh, no knowledge of of such things. It's not in their responsibility. The next one is all these arrows, of course. If we're if we have even if we have a username and password, we still don't know if is that a valid password, is it a valid user? So we'll need to go and make a lookup. Uh, to some user database. In a monolith, this works fairly well because it's a single request to a database, probably quite fast. The more services you get, the more this is going to be a bottleneck. So if, if, if all of these lookups take like five or 10 milliseconds, we're, we're still talking about 100 milliseconds before to service a single request. So that's, that's one problem of, of distributed authorization, or distributed identity. So the first thing we do or that we did 25 years ago is basically saying, let's not do authentication. Or we should do it, but let's not do that in our services. We'd rather delegate that responsibility to some, somebody else, and that would be a, an identity system. So the identity system, or rather than having the user providing uh, the credentials to us, the user provides their credentials to the identity system. That verifies the, uh, the identity of the user, and returns with a token. That token is then passed around between the services. So we're, we no longer need to verify credentials. Uh, we just need to trust the token. So we efficiently, we cut off half of the request being sent here. And of course, everyone wants a token. That's, if that's the keys to this kingdom, like everybody wants one. Uh, we have users, we have devices, we have other services. API integrations and so on. 
So how do these tokens obtain then? And Malcolm was, was kind of onto that when he talked uh, about OAuth 2, it's established as the de facto protocol for these kind of flows, uh, whether you're a person or a human, or, or if you're a machine. So OAuth defines both uh, programmatic or uh, interactive flows for humans and non-interactive flows for uh, clients, allowing everyone to get a token, since that's what we need for access. So OAuth is, is a bit funny. It's, it's called like the OAuth authorization framework, but it doesn't really solve the problem of authorization, at least not on a, a more fine-grained level, which is what we're looking for here. And another fun thing about OAuth, it's all about tokens. So it's like page after page after page, how to obtain a token. And what OAuth never tells you is what is a token. There's no mention or there's one line saying like, what a token is, is left up to the implementation. So we have no idea what it actually is. It just, here's how you get one. So uh, what is it then? Uh, should say uh, in passing, there is a, a, a quite uh, coarse grained or basic way to allow this token to carry scopes, which basically says this token can be used for this purpose but it should not be used for more uh, fine-grained authorization needs. So another thing OAuth doesn't mention is like, who is this person? Or who is the, who, what is a user? How do we describe a user? What kind of attributes can we expect? So the OpenID Connect standard, as, you meant, as Malcolm mentioned as well, uh, kind of an addition or add-on on top of OAuth to try and standardize on uh, what kind of attributes we can expect, things like email addresses, phone numbers, uh, user IDs, and so on. So we're trying to standardize that in, uh, as part of this identity package. Uh, so OpenID Connect kind of defines one type of token that describes a user, but it doesn't say much of uh, how, how do you identify as a machine or so. Uh, as a, an IoT device. OpenID Connect does not provide a solution for that. So uh, adding another standard to the identity package is clearly needed. We need some way to describe all of these uh, users or clients are authenticating in our system. So one problem here, if we don't know what a token is, a traditional approach uh, has been to say it's it's some opaque identifier. It's ABC123. The next one is ABC124. Uh, that works, but the problem is our services, they have no way of knowing what is what does that mean? What is ABC123? What does that stand for? Who does that represent? So the naive solution here is, okay, I don't know what this means. I'll need to ask the identity server who issued this token. And I'm sure you, you see we're all coming back to the same problem that where we started. We now have, uh, we now have to redraw all these arrows. So that's not, a good, that's not a good choice or a good solution. So that's basically uh, the final piece of the puzzle is to use JSON web tokens or something which is self-contained, where you sign the contents of the token and you can pass that around um, among your services. There's no need for extra lookups. They just need to verify the token, that it's valid, it comes from a trusted issuer, and distributed identity is, is pretty much solved. So that's great. That was, that was however, the, the easy part, or the simple bit. So if we try and look here what the evolution for access control uh, might look like, the first problem, or the most obvious problem, is of course this. That was a problem for identity, it's a problem for access control. We don't want to query the database. Now we know who the user is, we don't know what they're allowed to do. So we could go to a database and ask, are we allowed to do this or not? Again, this is not scale. So the first question is, like, where do we do authorization? And, uh, the, a simple model, and which, which, one which was uh, prevalent or popular for a long time, is, is this the gateway model or the centralized gateway model. It's basically caving in and saying, like, this is hard. Let's just do it once and be done with it. 
So we put a gateway component in front, we authorize the user. Once they're authorized, it's, it's an open highway. So there's a few problems here. Like one obvious problem is if you made it past the gateway, it's again, it's an open highway. There's no authorization being performed there. Another one is might be that this service might need to talk to this service. They're both behind the gateway. Should that not require any form of uh, authorization or, uh, or control of identity? So, it's, but it's very fast. It's a single point of failure for sure. It's not very secure. And it, it, it is an external dependency. So uh, for the last five, 10 years, a, a competing model uh, has been more and more, uh, made more and more popular, or I don't know, popular is the right word, but I think uh, with increase requirements like the GDPR, uh, banking grade things, we're, we're basically all required to do more than uh, what the gateway model provides. So the zero trust model basically says authorization and identity needs to, do, needs to be controlled everywhere. We can't trust other entities to have done this before us. Uh, so we're, how do we do that now? We have these JSON web tokens, we know the identity, and by coming back to this model, we, we are compliant with this kind of idea of zero trust because we don't, each service makes their own lookup, there's no, no implied trust. But again, we're back to where we started. So how would we make this better then? Any ideas? The first, the first thing we can do, this is kind of deceptively simple. I don't know if you all see here, what we can do here is we just repoint these arrows. And this works surprisingly well for a, a, a large majority of all applications. Rather than having them query the application or the authorization database, the database pushes permissions to each of these services. Uh, that means, of course, there might be a slight delay compared to querying uh, just in time. But it also means that if the database goes down, it's unreachable for a while, everything will just keep working as normal. Might again be a lag, could make a few wrong decisions. But this is a, a really good model and it works really well for uh, most cases. We still ha uh, have a few more problems with this model though. One of them is authorization logic embedded in these services. And uh, the more, the larger your organization, the more complex it is, the more heterogeneous, the more of these kind of programming languages and frameworks you introduce, these will all do authorization in their own specific way. They will all send their logs, or they will all log authorization decisions in their own specific way. And of course, they will all have their own specific bugs related to authorization. This is a nightmare to audit. This is, this is basically the environment that I got involved with when I started to work with authorization. And, and of course, another problem with this model, imagine now that we need to make a change in how we, uh, in, our, in, our, in our authorization code. I'd basically have to reach out to all these teams and say, uh, right, we need, we need to change this or that. And they're all going to try and do their best and do that. And, but that requires my requirements are very clear, and even if they are, they're still probably going to come, come out with four or five different implementations. So that's not a, that's not a good model, model either for a distributed and heterogeneous environment. So enter Open Policy Agent. What OPA is, it's an open source general purpose policy engine. And by policy engine, it basically means it stores a set of rules, and you ask it for decisions. It's a unified tool set and a framework for working with policy across the stack. It's not, it's not only made for authorization. You see all these logos around here. You can use it basically anywhere where you'd need policy, where you need rules. Can this uh, deployment go out, given that it's a public S3 bucket? Probably not. Can user X deploy to production uh, at 9 o'clock on a Saturday from the pub? Probably not. So basically anywhere you have rules, 
uh, you can describe those using OPA. And decoupling is a keyword here. Remember how we, we said uh, applications, they don't no longer need to, to do authentication. We decouple that from our applications. We sent our users off to an identity server. Same principle is what we're looking for here. So we want to decouple that type of decisions and move them somewhere else, preferably to OPA. Uh, as for more uh, technical details, policies are written in a declarative language called Rego. Uh, some popular use cases include Kubernetes admission control, what goes and what can't go into your kube clusters, microservice authorization, infrastructure policies, data source filtering, CI, CD pipelines, basically anywhere where you, uh, where you might have, want to have rules and you might want to enforce those. So how does it work then? Given that it integrates with all these technologies, it's a fairly simple model and I guess it's, it must be. Uh, the way it works, a request hits our service and by service we have a very broad definition it could be our microservice, it could be a Kafka broker, it could be uh, a Linux PAM module, whatever it is. Rather than making a decision, should this be allowed or not, oh, the service delegates that decision to OPA, which based on the policies we've loaded in there, optionally some external data, makes a decision and sends it back to the client for and the client enforces that decision. So OPA makes a decision, it doesn't enforce anything. They will just tell you, no, this user should not be allowed. What that means, how you enforce that, that is up to your application. So what that, what that means then is, is in the zero trust model, we'd basically put an OPA running next to each of these services. We now have a uh, a unified way of doing authorization where each of these services, they don't, they don't handle uh, authentication and they don't handle authorization. They delegate that responsibility to, uh, to OPA. So we can write authorization policy in one unified language, uh, have logs, decision logs provided in one unified format for any number of services and any number uh, of programming languages, which is which is uh, the beauty of decoupling. So by that, we have basically solved the problem of distributed authorization. There's uh, a few more details around here, which is of course, uh, once, when you start to have this for hundreds or thousands of services, you'll need, one, uh, you'll need some way of, of, of managing all this and to, to control, control that. And that's, that's pretty much what Styra uh, provides. It's a commercial control plane for running OPA at scale. So distributed authorization solved. I think we have one minute <laughs> for questions. I was. Yeah, yep. fantastic. Thanks.